Thank you. That concludes general questions. We will now move to First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister agree with Pete Wishart, currently the SNP's longest serving MP at Westminster, who said earlier on this week it was a fair point that her government had imposed too many COVID restrictions over Christmas? First Minister. Uh, I'm not sure that is a fair representation uh, of Pete Wishart's comments, uh, but can I first take the opportunity, President Officer, to recognise uh, that Pete Wishart is, uh, I think, Scotland's longest serving Member of Parliament, which I think goes to show what an outstanding service Pete yeah. Wishart does uh, for his constituents. <laughs> and let me take the opportunity, and I'm sure Douglas Ross will join me in paying tribute uh, to his public service. Um, I think we introduced uh, a series of balanced uh, protective measures over the Christmas period, um, coupled with the extraordinary response of the public uh, changing their behaviour and, of course, the extraordinary success of the booster programme, we are thankfully now in a better position than we might have been when we were looking ahead uh, before the Christmas period. But we're not in a position uh, that I think allows us any complacency. COVID rates are still high. There are still significant uncertainties ahead, which is why uh, I think doctors, nurses, NHS managers, trade unions all expressed some concern uh, with the Prime Minister's announcement yesterday to lift all restrictions at this stage, including uh, the requirement to wear face coverings. So we will continue to take a proportionate and balanced set of decisions to try to get through this next, I hope, final phase of the pandemic and keep the country as safe as we possibly can do uh, while we're doing so. Douglas Ross. The First Minister said it wasn't a fair representation of Pete Wishart's comments. It was a direct quote. <laughs> he, he was asked... Has the First Minister in Scotland introduced too many COVID restrictions over Christmas? And his response was, that is a fair point. He agreed with the premise of the question. Uh, and the First Minister went on to laud his parliamentary career. Perhaps she could maybe listen to him when he, an SNP member, elected representative, is saying the restrictions imposed over Christmas were too much. Because the First Minister imposed restrictions that had a massive impact on jobs, on businesses on people's mental and physical health. But we can now see they weren't needed. It was the Scottish public's actions, not the SNP government's restrictions, that got this right. The First Minister has tried to build a reputation for caution during this pandemic, but she was far too gung-ho in imposing extra restrictions last month. Will she now accept that her government went too far? First Minister. Well, you know, Firstly, uh, the public did comply. Uh, they complied with what the government asked them to do. I, I, think, I think Douglas Ross is striking rather a desperate note right now, uh, just as if he is seriously, seriously describing Pete Wisher showing, as all elected representatives should, uh, some respect for the point somebody was making to him, as evidence that Pete Wisher agrees with Douglas Ross uh, rather than with this government, then all that says to people is that Douglas Ross has, uh, show, is showing rather more political desperation right now than we even thought he might uh, have been. Uh, we've taken a balanced approach. Uh, let me uh, just say uh, what I think. Uh, at the moment, this cautious approach is the one that we should be taking. That's uh, my sentiments. Those are not actually my words, though. Those are the words of Sandesh Gohani, oh. MSP, oh. on BBC Scotland on the 7th of January. Uh, so if Douglas Ross is uh, basing his entire line of questioning to me right now on something Pete Wishart said, then what is his response uh, to his own MSP saying that the cautious approach is the one that we should be taking? Uh, but then we've got uh, Professor Susan Meekie, a member of the UK Government SAGE Committee. Uh, Scotland is doing something that is very good from a public health point of view. And of course, the Scottish approach is in line with the Welsh Government's approach and the Northern Irish Government's approach. We're taking a sensible approach through this, which is why infection levels, although dropping now, thankfully, in all parts of the UK, uh, are lower in Scotland than they are in England right now, and over the festive period, uh, the numbers of people in hospital proportionately were lower. So we are not out of the woods yet, uh, although things look far more positive, but I'm going to continue to take a cautious approach because, frankly, uh, the price of throwing caution to the wind is not paid by governments. Uh, the price of throwing caution to the wind 
is paid by people across the country in terms of ill health and, sadly, in some cases, serious illness and death. And that's a price I don't think I should impose on the people of Scotland. Douglas Ross. First Minister, serious illness, illness and death doesn't just come from COVID. It comes from restrictions being put in place that have a massive impact on people's mental health, on their physical health. We have been living with this pandemic now for two years. And I think the First Minister would do better to respond to the points being made. She may not like them, but the points and questions being made, rather than launching personal attacks on the opposition politicians who do it. Because not only did the First Minister impose unnecessary restrictions, she actually wanted to go further. The First Minister repeatedly claimed throughout December that the UK Government was holding her back from putting Scotland into lockdown again. She wanted to close down the economy, no matter, no matter the impact that would have on Scottish jobs and businesses. But the First Minister promised compensation when her restrictions were introduced. Yet now we're coming out of the restrictions, that compensation still hasn't been delivered to many businesses. They've not received a single penny. This week, the Federation of Small Businesses said, and I quote, thousands of Scottish businesses needlessly go under every year because of late payment. Will the First Minister accept that her government is currently the worst offender of late payments in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, no, um, but can I say to Douglas Ross, the pandemic uh, is causing uh, the serious impact on individuals and businesses across Scotland, the UK, Europe and the entire world. Much as we might all like to be able to do so, and, and believe me, I would love to be able to do so, we can't just magic it away. No country is able to do that. And I have to say to Douglas Ross, he has uh, stood in his position in this chamber at every key juncture in the management of this pandemic uh, since he's been uh, back in this chamber, and he's opposed the decisions the Scottish Government has taken, even at times when there were exactly the same decisions that were being taken by his colleagues um, in uh, the Westminster Government. He has uh, decided to take an entirely opportunistic approach to the handling of a global pandemic. And I think people will judge that, and I don't think they will judge it very kindly. If we had listened to Douglas Ross, then over these past months, we wouldn't have had sensible measures like uh, asking people to wear face coverings. We wouldn't have had other mitigations uh, in our schools, for example. We wouldn't have advised people sensibly to work from home. Uh, and we wouldn't, therefore, be in the stronger position that we're in right now, able to lift uh, these protective measures from Monday of next week. So, uh, given that Douglas Ross has called it wrong, literally, at every juncture of this pandemic, forgive me if I'm not going to start listening to him now. Um, in terms of business support, of course, uh, much of the, much of the, and, and incidentally, on the issue of opposition politicians and, and quoting people, uh, Douglas Ross opened his uh, line of questioning today, misrepresenting, in my view, Pete Wishart, and then he takes issue with the fact that I give a direct quote from Sandesh Gohani. Uh, and let me repeat that direct quote. At the moment, this cautious approach is the one that we should be taking. Uh, on the issue of business support, of course, much of this business support will not be available to businesses suffering the same impact south of the border. All local authorities... Uh, if Douglas Ross doesn't think they're suffering the same impact, then I suggest he really needs to get out a little bit more. Uh, all local authorities have started processing payments. Some local authorities have made very good progress and say that they've uh, already paid almost all of the hospitality and leisure businesses eligible for support. All local authorities are on track to complete 100% of payments to hospitality and leisure businesses affected by the Christmas cancellations and physical distancing by the 31st of uh, January. So that support available here that is not uh, available elsewhere and we'll continue to do the right thing by businesses. Douglas Ross. The First Minister needs to make her mind up. She's accusing the Conservatives of opposing every measure she puts forward and then in the same breath she's accusing the Conservatives for wanting a cautious approach. It is simply not, to, it is not opportunistic to trust the people in Scotland, to trust that they can learn to live with COVID rather than having to live with her government's restrictions which are having a massive impact 
on jobs, on businesses and communities across Scotland, and they are not getting the money or the support that they were promised. And the First Minister has got the big decisions wrong over the last few months. Too quick to bring in unnecessary COVID restrictions. Too late to launch mass vaccination centres. Too late to change the self-isolation rules. Too late to get funding to businesses who need it. The First Minister says she does not shy away from mistakes she has made in the handling of this pandemic. So can't she finally just admit that by introducing these tough restrictions here in Scotland before Christmas and by wanting to introduce even tougher restrictions, she simply made the wrong call? First Minister. Well, I will let the people of Scotland uh, judge the impact of the calls uh, I and my government have made. But let me say this. Uh, right now, on first doses, on second doses, on third doses, on booster vaccination doses, Scotland is the most vaccinated part of the United Kingdom. So, presenting officer, if Douglas Ross's proposition is that we left it too late, then what on earth does that say about his own colleagues uh, in the Westminster government? We also, in terms of the ONS figures uh, this week, uh, infection levels uh, in, Scotland, in England right now are over 20% higher than in Scotland. Um, I don't think it's a competition, but if Douglas Ross wants to make these comparisons, uh, then they uh, are the comparisons. There is the data. Um, but can I say gently to Douglas Ross, because I know he's having a tough time uh, politically, but can I say gently, uh, it is inconsistent, entirely inconsistent. Uh, there is no consistency in saying, as his health spokesperson did, uh, that the cautious approach is the one that we should be taking and then opposing every cautious measure that we choose to take for opportunistic reasons. So can I suggest that Douglas Ross just gets his own house in order, uh, perhaps suggest to more of his colleagues uh, that they obey the rules that are in place when they are in place and leaves this government to get on with steering this country responsibly and in a mature, grown-up fashion through the global pandemic. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, the First Minister said that the auction of major offshore wind projects was one of the most significant days that Scotland has seen in a very, very long time. I, I welcome inward investment, but it should not come at the cost of the Scottish economy, our just transition or our values. So let us be clear about what has happened. This SNP government have sold on the cheap the right to profit from Scotland's energy transition to multinational companies with questionable human rights records. One of the new owners of Scotland's seabed were fined $54 million for bribing Nigerian officials and $88 million for bribing Indonesian officials. Another one was found to have contributed to human rights abuses at one of its construction sites, of destroying villages in Myanmar, of relying on forced labour and using slavery to build pipelines. Surely these aren't people the Scottish Government should be doing business with. First Minister. Uh, County States Scotland uh, made the decisions on the companies, the consortiums uh, that would uh, be awarded uh, the status uh, to uh, develop projects uh, around our coast. Uh, they have uh, appropriate processes in place to do due diligence. But this is one of the most exciting uh, things uh, for Scotland in a long, long time, which uh, probably is why uh, Scottish Labour has been so negative about it. Not only does this give us the potential uh, to meet our own energy needs from renewable sources, it positions us uh, with the ability to be a major exporter of renewable energy, including green hydrogen, and it gives uh, enormous potential for our supply chain. The estimate is for every gigawatt of power that will be generated from these projects, there will be a billion pounds of investment in our supply chain. And for the first time, of course, uh, companies uh, have had to set out in statements uh, what they will do to support our supply chain. So this is good news. Uh, there are complicated consenting, consenting and planning processes that lie ahead. Uh, but this offers massive potential to Scotland and its potential we intend to seize with both hands. Anna Sarwar. I, I agree with the opportunity, uh, but values matter. Just last week, the SNP were right to accuse the Tory government of tolerating human rights abuses as a price worth paying to secure deals for the UK. This week, the SNP has done the same. So what Nicola Sturgeon, in effect, is saying, it's bad when the Tories do it, but it's OK when the SNP do it. There's another concerning part of this deal. 
Uh, one of the new owners of Scotland's seabed is the Swedish-owned state-owned energy company. Uh, that state-owned Swedish energy company can now use their part of the Scottish seabed to keep energy bills down for people in Sweden. The First Minister once promised a Scottish state-owned energy company. In fact, this SNP government spent almost £500,000 of taxpayers' money on the project before scrapping the plans. Why is it that people of Sweden now own a bigger stake in Scottish energy supply and distribution than the Scottish people? The SNP, not stronger for Scotland, but stronger for Sweden. First Minister. Yes, Sweden is also an independent country with full control uh, over energy, which of course this government and this parliament uh, doesn't have. But that's a, a matter that Anasarwar might want to reflect on a little, a little bit more. And of course, just today, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero is talking about the opportunities. The opportunities are in consultation uh, for our plans for uh, an energy public agency to, to steer uh, these uh, kinds of developments in the future. Uh, this is a thoroughly positive opportunity uh, for Scotland and no wonder then that Scottish Labour just wants to gurn about it and be negative. That is, that's what's characterised Scottish Labour for a long time and it's why they're sitting over there uh, these days, not there and certainly not here. Uh, let me just repeat the opportunity. The opportunity to meet our own energy needs uh, for, from renewable sources and to keep energy costs down. Uh, the opportunity to export renewable energy to other countries, the opportunity to grow a supply chain and create thousands, possibly tens of thousands of jobs, and of course the opportunity to raise revenues for the Scottish Government, for public services uh, here in Scotland. Uh, from the lease options alone, £700 million, and then when these projects are operational, uh, there will be rent fees in addition to that. So this is a thoroughly positive opportunity, and perhaps Anas Sarwar uh, just for once could find it within himself to be positive about the potential of Scotland. Anas Sarwar. I've, I've, said, I've said I welcome in investment. I've said I welcome and recognise the opportunity. But this is such a desperate, poor, poor reply. The First Minister often likes to accuse opposition parties of demonstrating a brass neck. That was a brass neck from the First Minister in that reply. Accuse the Tories of bad values and human rights. Accept human rights values uh, as being part of the price worth paying for Scottish opportunities here. Because this is about the Scottish supply chain. Scottish companies and Scottish jobs. Because the sad reality is that this is an SNP government that doesn't understand economic development. Scottish bridges built with Chinese steel. Scottish wind farms with turbines built in Indonesia. Ferries not built with Scottish shipyards, but built in Poland and Turkey. And now Scotland's seabed owned by foreign multinationals with woeful human rights records. We've heard the list of promises from the First Minister before. A state-owned energy company Question, promised please. never delivered. Scotland's becoming a renewables like Saudi Arabia promised but never delivered. 130,000 green please, jobs promised but never delivered. After 15 years, isn't it the case that this is an SNP government that has sold out Scottish jobs, sold off Scottish assets and now sold out Scottish Thank values? Thank you, Mr Sarwar. First Minister. I, I, I'm just sitting here... Uh, reflecting almost unbelievably actually uh, that Anas Sarwar has just uh, accused me of behaving like a Tory uh, the day after his party threw open the doors <laughs> to a Tory MP. There is now so little difference between Labour and the Tories uh, that their MPs are just interchangeable. So brass neck uh, I would say to Mr Sarwar I think he'll be polishing his for the rest of the day. Look Anas Sarwar and his uh, many predecessors as Scottish Labour leader, uh, I have to say I've forgotten how many predecessors as Scottish Labour leader Anas Sarwar has had, but they've been trotting out these negative, talk-down Scotland tropes for years. And all that has happened is that they've gone further and further and further down in the ratings in Scottish politics. They've lost more and more votes, uh, and my party's share of the vote has increased. So there is real... I came into the chamber expecting political desperation from Douglas Ross today. I think I've seen even more from Anna Sarwar, which probably says all we need to know. I'll get on. 
uh, with encouraging the potential uh, for Scottish renewable energy, for Scottish jobs, for revenue for the Scottish Government. And I'll be delighted at the next time of asking to put that record uh, before the Scottish people. I'm not so sure Anna Sarwar will be quite so keen. We'll now take supplementary questions and I call Fiona Hislop. First Minister, increasing energy prices are of very real concern. What discussions has she had with the Westminster Government on help for families to combat the spiralling financial cost of the energy crisis? First Minister. Well, the energy crisis, the cost of living uh, crisis, is increasing uh, on a daily basis at the moment. It is of deep concern to this Government. We're taking a range of measures ourselves through our £41 million winter fund, uh, seven new benefits aimed at low-income households, and of course, shortly, we will double the Scottish child payment. But of course, key powers do remain reserved to Westminster. Uh, we have written to the UK Government countless times about poverty and also just uh, last week set out further actions uh, which uh, we have outlined uh, that they must urgently take to tackle rising energy bills. Uh, but if a government, uh, as is the case with the Westminster Government, is so busy trying to deal with self-inflicted sleaze and scandal and daily defections and deflections, then their focus is not on the cost of living crisis, it's on themselves. And this is both deeply regrettable and deeply serious because they are right now neglecting the real issues that people are facing right across the country. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, diabetes rates are rapidly increasing across Scotland, with diagnosis more than doubling in the last 20 years. Diabetes Scotland reported last week that access to the correct diabetes technology, such as instant pumps, can be life-changing for patients, but just over 10% of 18-year-olds use them. The gap in diabetes outcomes between affluent and deprived areas in Scotland is widening. So can I ask the First Minister what urgent action can be put in place to ensure this worrying trend is reversed. First Minister. It is uh, an important issue. We will work uh, with Diabetes Scotland to take forward the findings of the report, uh, making sure that there is both access to insulin pumps uh, for young people, but for people of all ages is important, but also that they are used and they are used effectively is vital. Uh, we have uh, made improvements in years gone by in this, and we will continue to focus on uh, making further improvements for the sake of people across Scotland who live with that condition. Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the First Minister will be aware of the anger in local authorities across Scotland that the Scottish Government is not planning to compensate them for the upcoming raise in national insurance, as councils in England and Wales are being compensated. This will inevitably cause further cuts to already stretched services. How does the First Minister justify leaving Scottish local authorities worse off for this change than their English counterparts? First Minister. Well, firstly, the UK Treasury block grant uh, to the Scottish Budget does not identify consequential funding for national insurance contributions, so there are no identifiable consequentials to pass on. Um, however, uh, we are uh, providing a settlement to local government that is fair uh, and crucially affordable. The overall local government funding package of more than £12.5 billion uh, represents uh, an increase in real terms of 5.1 per cent. In revenue alone, it's a real terms increase of 4.9 per cent. Uh, so we'll continue to treat local government as fairly as possible and support local government uh, as far as we possibly can in delivering the services that people across the country rely on. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. As the First Minister will be aware, my Dogs Protection and Livestock Amendment Scotland Act 2021 is now in force and provides Police Scotland and the courts with greater powers to investigate those who allow their dogs to worry, attack or kill livestock in Scotland's countryside. Livestock worrying can have serious animal welfare implications as well as significant financial and emotional impact on farmers. Can the First Minister, in light of lambing season approaching, outline what action the Scottish Government is taking to promote public awareness of the updated legislation? First Minister. Well, can I again congratulate Emma Harper on her success with this legislation? It is extremely important uh, legislation. The Scottish Government, I can assure her, uh, will take appropriate steps to raise awareness of it. Um, and, uh, of course, we will do everything we can working uh, with partners as appropriate to ensure uh, appropriate enforcement of it. But it is a significant step forward uh, and one that I know will be particularly welcomed across rural Scotland. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Since the extension of free personal care, 
for people under the age of 65. No data has been recorded on the number of people who have now received this care. Now, given the problems which we've seen during the pandemic on people accessing care packages, and in fact, with many being removed or cut uh, for individuals, we are finding that more and more people are reporting that it is people with complex needs and life-limiting conditions are not getting that care. So can I ask the First Minister, will the Scottish Government agree to establish a national recovery group alongside COSLA today uh, to make sure that people who are entitled to free personal care get that and this is fully restored and delivered across Scotland? First Minister. Well, firstly, everybody who is entitled to free personal care should get free personal care. And of course, the entitlements to free personal care in Scotland go uh, far beyond uh, the situation in, in other parts of the UK. Um, I'm not going to give a, a commitment today to the proposition. I will consider it carefully, but I, I'm not going to say right now before having the chance to consider it that I think that would be the right way forward. Uh, I will uh, also, however, uh, look at uh, the issue of uh, data uh, and come back to the member uh, with an indication of when data is likely to be published, uh, which will give uh, a sense of uh, how many people are uptaking that entitlement. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. Constituents of Lansfield Quay in Glasgow are living with what has been deemed 22 intolerable risks to life as a result of flammable cladding on their building. They have been struggling to get a single building assessment on it, which was promised in June 2021. Can I ask the First Minister what she and her government could do to assist my constituent in obtaining this information as a matter of urgency? First Minister. Well, obviously, I, I know from uh, my own uh, position as constituency MSP here uh, how important this is. Uh, the government is taking uh, forward steps to ensure uh, single building assessments. I will ask the housing minister to write to the member with a full update on that work and what the next steps in it are. Beatrice Wishart. Oh. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm having a hiccup with my glasses and the mask. Uh, can the First Minister indicate what the Scottish Government's response is regarding the impact on Scotland of reports that the BBC licence fee will be cut after the current funding deal ends in 2027? First Minister. Well, I'm sure every uh, member uh, across this chamber from time to time will have gripes uh, with or criticisms of the BBC, but the BBC is an important part of our uh, broadcasting uh, framework, and I think we should all defend uh, the principle of public service uh, broadcasting. Uh, so I'm deeply concerned uh, at the announcements or, or hints of announcements that we saw earlier this week from the UK government. Um, I, I suspect um, and uh, I think there is some evidence that these were an attempt to divert attention from the Prime Minister's uh, troubles. Uh, but nevertheless, I think all of us have to stand up for these principles um, and guard against uh, this government and the damage it seems willing to do uh, to key institutions, uh, often just to try to save its own skin. Question number three, Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what impact the UK Government's Nationality and Borders Bill will have on devolved functions. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government has profound concerns about this bill. We are currently cons considering its potential impact on areas that are devolved. If we conclude there is an impact on the legislative competence of this Parliament, we will lodge a legislative consent memorandum setting out the relevant provisions. Uh, there is no doubt, however, that the bill will have significant impacts on devolved services at local authorities and communities. Uh, Scottish Ministers have written to the UK Government in relation to this bill five times, outlining our significant concerns, including with the Welsh Government, who share these concerns. I also note that the House of Commons Joint Committee on Human Rights yesterday said that the reforms of the asylum system proposed in the bill, uh, and I'm quoting, would fail to meet the UK's human rights obligations and risk exacerbating the already unacceptable backlog. So we will continue to urge the UK Government to introduce a humane, effective and efficient system that delivers for people living in Scotland, including those who are fleeing war and persecution. Maggie Chapman. The Prime Minister's intention to use, to use the military to prevent asylum seekers reaching the UK is deeply immoral, as is the possibility of trading access to COVID vaccines for the right to open detention centres in other countries. The First Minister will be aware of the appalling circumstances faced by many asylum seekers in Scotland, including in, in Aberdeen in my region, accommodated in hotels but not given basic support or things like toiletries, culturally sensitive food, language classes and so on. While we do not have the powers to counter these racist policies, we can make sure that asylum seekers and refugees in Scotland are treated better. I am sure the First Minister will join me in condemning the plans by the Prime Minister and his cruel and inhuman Home Office. Will she also outline what lessons have been learnt by the tragic death at Park Inn in Glasgow 
and say what more we can do to prevent the growth of the use of institutional accommodation across Scotland and improve the support available through local authorities so that asylum seekers are treated with dignity. First Minister. Well, can I thank Maggie Chapman for the question? There's a lot of uh, detail in that question, and I'll undertake to ask uh, the relevant minister to write uh, with more detailed answers than uh, time will allow me to give today, including, for example, on uh, the question of lessons learned uh, from the dreadful uh, circumstances around uh, parking in Glasgow. Um, the UK government, though, uh, its plans to divert vessels in the channel are dangerous, and I think it's important that we are all clear that they will significantly increase uh, risk to life. Uh, Medicines on Frontiers uh, stated, and I'm quoting again, that pursuing a policy of forced returns and engaging in pushback tactics is dangerous, inhumane and in breach of international law. It puts lives at risk at sea. Um, in my view, people seeking asylum um, in the UK should be accommodated within communities where they can begin to rebuild their lives, where they have access to essential services uh, and the support and advocacy they need, um, and also where they can make a contribution to the communities that they are living in, and the UK Government is uh, failing to provide that. Uh, the Home Office has not shared yet its review uh, of the tragedy at the Park Inn, but as I said a moment ago, I will ask uh, the Scottish Government Minister uh, responsible to write uh, further about that. Um, I think what we saw at the weekend, the comments we saw at the weekend, for example, about use of military, a bit you know, like the comments on the BBC, were an attempt to divert attention from the troubles of the self-inflicted troubles of the Prime Minister. Uh, but we should not be using the BBC and we should absolutely not be using refugees and asylum seekers in that way. I say we, the UK government, should not be using refugees and asylum seekers in that way. It is utterly despicable uh, and I think uh, a sign, another sign of the moral decay at the heart of this UK government. Question number four, Stephanie Callaghan, who's joining us online. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to Public Health Scotland census data, which states that three out of four care home places are now provided by private companies. First Minister. While the percentage of private sector care homes has increased, the overall balance of provision in care home places between the public and private sector has not changed markedly over the past decade. Uh, the number of care home places has remained relatively stable, which reflects our policy to support people at home for as long as possible. As we move towards the creation of the National Care Service, an ethical approach will be at the heart of how we commission and deliver services. All social care providers across Scotland from the independent third and public sectors will continue to be subject to the same regulations, standards and guidelines. Ensuring the continuation of high quality care home provision is and will continue to be the priority of the Scottish Government. Stephanie Callaghan. Uh, I thank the First Minister for her response. Given the prevalence of private care home provision across Suddingston Bales Hill constituency in wider Scotland, how will the National Care Service deliver improved terms and conditions for private care home staff and ensure that high quality care for residents? First Minister. There is no doubt that the National Care Service it will be the most significant change in public services, probably since the establishment of the National Health Service. Uh, so we're committed to delivering a service uh, by the end of this parliament in order to ensure that everybody gets the high quality care they're entitled to, regardless of where they live in the country. Uh, the consultation uh, on the establishment of the National Care Service proposed that it will oversee the delivery of care, improve standards, ensure enhanced paying conditions for workers and provide uh, better support for unpaid carers, as well as supporting ethical commissioning of care. So all of that uh, will lead to better outcomes for those who rely on our care services. It's important work. It's difficult work. It is in many aspects controversial work. But I think, I hope that by the end of this parliament, this will be a significant public sector reform that future generations will come back uh, and look on as fondly uh, as we look on the establishment of the National Health Service. Jackie Bailey. Irrespective of the status of the sector, the employees in social care are predominantly female and they're predominantly low paid. It is still the case that you can get paid more by working in hospitality and retail. There were vacancies before the pandemic, made worse by the pandemic. So will the First Minister back the GMB and Unite in their campaigns to pay care workers £15 per hour, starting with an immediate rise to £12 per hour in April? First Minister. Well, we are increasing uh, the pay of those who work in the care sector. 
Um, and I think it's important that while Jackie Bailey, as she always does, uh, sets out the problem, it's this government that's delivering the solutions. So we are increasing uh, the pay of social care workers. We will continue to do that. Of course, we have to uh, do it within the bounds of affordability, uh, and we will do that. Uh, but we are also committed to a national care service that, of course, will have collective bargaining and better paying conditions uh, for social care staff absolutely at its heart. So we will continue to get on with doing the hard work uh, that delivers the outcomes that Jackie Bailey calls for. Question number five, Finlay Carson. To ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the delivery of Lot 1 of the R100 programme. First Minister. Of course, broadband investment is reserved to Westminster, uh, but given the UK Government's failure to deliver on that, alongside its failure to deliver on so many other things, uh, we've had to step in um, and uh, make a difference. The R100 North contract was signed in December 2020. Despite the pandemic, a huge amount of preparatory work has been completed since. Uh, a remodelling exercise ensured that every connection delivered will be full fibre uh, and survey work for over 5,000 properties and 16 subsea cables, uh, which will deliver vital backhaul connectivity uh, to 15 Scottish islands. We anticipate by the end of June, the North Lock contract will have delivered over 4,000 connections. Uh, the R100 Scottish Broadband Voucher Scheme also ensures that everyone who wants a superfast broadband connection now can have one, uh, with around 750 connections already delivered in the north of Scotland. Finlay Carson. Thank you. Uh, not surprised by, by your response. And no doubt you will continue to try and throw the public into believing that the rollout of broadband is reserved and matter. And that line is wearing very thin. The practical broad, rollout of broadband is, is devolved to the Scottish Government. And that line, as I say, is wearing things like the patience of the people in rural Scotland. The SNP talked up this scheme as reaching 100%, but rural communities are not getting what they're expected. Nearly 37,000 properties in Lot 1 will not get fibre from the main scheme. And the voucher scheme you talk about is delivering nothing, with only 4% of uptake so far. So the First Minister surely should rename the R100 scheme, promised by the SNP, as the R40 scheme. And it's five years late. The SNP promised their flagship R100 scheme would be delivered to everybody by 2021. Will the First Minister now apologise to the people and the businesses in rural and remote communities who might not get connected at all, and most of them won't get connected until 2027? First Minister. Through the R100 contracts, the R100 Scottish Broadband Voucher Scheme and, of course, commercial coverage as well, uh, we've ensured that every premises in Scotland can access a super-fast broadband connection, um, despite telecoms being reserved. And that's not a matter of opinion. Uh, that's a matter of fact in the Scotland Act, which the member is free uh, to go and check. Uh, to date, the UK government's contribution to the R100 programme totals £31.5 million, 5% of the total, compared to £579 million invested by the Scottish Government. And the UK Government's own project, uh, Gigabit, has yet to award a single procurement contract. So again, the Scottish Government is getting on with the job of delivering connections, while all the Scottish Conservatives can do uh, is gripe and gurn about it. Thank you. Um, before we move on to question six, can I just remind members to desist from shouting across the chamber when we're trying to hear questions and answers? And at question number six, I call Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to ScotRail's plans to cut ticket office opening hours at 120 stations and to close free ticket offices entirely. First Minister. Well, the aim of this review is, of course, the modernisation of railway stations. Um, clearly, uh, to most people, technology has changed how people want to access information and tickets. But, of course, we also need to acknowledge the importance of local staff services on the ground where and when they are needed. Uh, this consultation offers the public the chance to have their say on how to provide an efficient, modern service for the future, and we would encourage people to get involved. We will await the consultation findings before any final decisions are made on the proposals. Neil Bibby. Ticket office staff play a crucial role in making our railway safe and accessible, and many go above and beyond, such as Dalmuir workers whose quick thinking recently saved a life. A properly staffed rail network is central to reducing car use and meeting Scotland's climate ambitions. Yet under this government, rail is being undermined. ScotRail is cutting 300 services per day, 
Fares will be hiked up by 3.8 per cent next week. Ticket desks are shutting, and there is still no fully integrated smart ticketing for passengers. To drive modal shift, the rail network must be more attractive and more accessible to passengers. So will the First Minister stop these ticket office closures? First Minister. We'll consult on what a modern system of railway stations and offices looks like. I absolutely agree um, about the importance uh, of ticket office staff and where they are, are necessary. Uh, it's important to recognise that. But everybody knows that at many railway stations now, uh, the ticket process is, is automated. Uh, so we have to reflect that on how these services are delivered in future. And it's right that we consult properly so that we come to the right uh, balanced decisions. Uh, we're investing heavily in our railways. We will continue to do so to ensure that it provides uh, a service uh, that people in Scotland need and have a right to expect and, and that they deserve. Uh, and also just to continue this theme of opposition parties uh, calling for things, but this government getting on with delivery. Of course, it's this government that is in the process of bringing ScotRail into public ownership, delivering the nationalisation that Scottish Labour only talks about. John Mason. Hey, thank you. Uh, given that passenger numbers are dramatically down on the railways and uh, ScotRail therefore depends on the public purse for an increased subsidy, does the First Minister agree that the ScotRail does have to look at its costs and reduce them if possible? First Minister. We've got to make sure uh, that we have a modern service, that we have a service uh, that is efficient, and of course uh, for taxpayers that we have a service that provides value for money. But we are supporting a rail franchises uh, right now with more than a billion pounds, uh, including £450 million of additional funding uh, via the, the pandemic emergency measures. Um, and we will continue to do so to ensure that Scotland does have the railway service that it needs and deserves. Uh, and of course, as I said earlier on, we'll bring it into uh, public ownership, which I think is something the majority of people will welcome. Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, 50 per cent of lung cancer patients are diagnosed at stage four uh, with mortality rates high for this cancer. During COVID restrictions, there were 25 per cent less people diagnosed and 25 per cent less people in treatment. Does the First Minister recognise that COVID restrictions have a significant impact on many of the conditions that will be felt long after the COVID pandemic has passed? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. I think, um, if memory serves me correctly, we had an exchange uh, on this issue, a very important exchange on this issue uh, last week. Early diagnosis of cancer and uh, the earliest possible staging uh, of cancer is vital. That's why we're investing so heavily in the Detect uh, Cancer Early programme. It's why we have established uh, or are establishing fast track cancer diagnostic centres so that people with symptoms uh, that are not, not the most common symptoms of, of cancer uh, can get the same uh, fast track access and, and fast track, we hope, diagnosis um, as those on the urgent suspicion of cancer uh, referral pathway. So that is really important and uh, we're absolutely committed to ensuring the earliest possible diagnosis. Of course, staging is not the only thing that's important. We then need to make sure uh, that people get quick access uh, to high quality care and treatment and that's a big part of our focus uh, in terms of cancer services too. And Neil Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With UK inflation hitting a 30-year high and energy costs uh, spiralling for households with no action from the UK Government and the standard rate of universal credit having been cut by £20 per week uh, by the UK Government, can the First Minister outline what impact uh, this has all had on her Government's ability to meet her child poverty targets uh, and also whether or not she supports the Poverty Alliance's campaign to see the punitive welfare cap scrapped by the UK Government? First Minister. Yes, I, I do fully support that Poverty Alliance campaign. Um, I'll be blunt about it. The UK government is making the poorest poorer, um, and they're doing that knowingly, and it is utterly despicable. Uh, the removal of the £20 a week uh, universal credit uplift uh, has impacted some of the poorest families in our society. And these actions are making it more difficult for the Scottish government uh, to live up to our responsibilities to tackle child poverty. Uh, but we are doing more, doubling the Scottish child payment. The Scottish child payment, a, a child payment like the Scottish child payment, doesn't exist in any other part of the UK. Uh, and having established it, we're now taking steps to double it. So we're doing everything we can. But if we 
uh, were up against the government pulling in the opposite direction, we'd be able to do more and have a much greater impact, which is, of course, the powerful argument for having all of these levers in the hands of Scottish governments and the Scottish Parliament, not leaving them in the hands of Westminster governments. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a short pause before members' business.